Hi, and welcome to the final video in our interaction section of the course. This video is going to talk about conservation biology. This is a watercolor by John James Audubon of the Passenger Pigeon. At the time that Audubon made this painting, the Passenger Pigeon was probably the most numerous bird in the world. The North American flock of passenger pigeons was multiple billions of birds in size. When migrating, the flock would pass overhead in a number of days. And as a result, they were really easy to catch, kill, and eat. And that's what Americans in the 1800s did. They caught, killed, and ate the most numerous bird in the world until it went extinct. The last passenger pigeon known to exist, Martha, died in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. You can find her stuffed skeleton in the Smithsonian, which is where I took this picture a couple of summers ago. The passenger pigeon is by no means alone in this. There are many different endlings that have, we have known throughout human history. The last member of a species like Benjamin, the last Tasmanian tiger ever known, or Lonesome George, the last member of his particular population of Galapagos tortoises. In almost every case, the populations were driven to extinction through the actions of humans. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this video. How do humans interact with the rest of the biological system? And so we're going to first talk about human impacts on biodiversity and how the human population has the effects that it has on the rest of the biological system. And then we'll talk about approaches that are taken in conservation biology to try to prevent this kind of thing from continuing to happen and keep our ecosystems as functional as we can into the future of our life on the planet. Let's start with some good news. The human era is one of maximal biodiversity on the planet. In the entire history of the planet, biodiversity has never been as high as it is right now during the ascendancy of the human population. Humans need the ecosystems that this biodiversity provides. They provide us with ecosystem services and the various other things that we need in order to remain alive and functional in the world. And as we've discussed previously, ecosystems need biodiversity. The smaller the populations of organisms in an ecosystem, the less diversity there is, the less resilience those populations have, which leads to even smaller populations and less diversity and less resilience and so on and so forth, down what is known as the extinction vortex. So in order to keep our ecosystem functional, we need to maintain the biodiversity that we find in those ecosystems. Now for some bad news. Humans are not inherently good at preserving biodiversity. This graph shows the percent survival of large mammal species on the major continents of the planet once anatomically modern humans arrived on the scene, and you can see that in almost each instance the amount of large mammal species declines precipitously after the arrival of humans. That's completely understandable since humans require food and other resources, and the killing of large mammals was an obvious way to get those resources in the ancestral condition. But humans are also not particularly good at understanding biodiversity. Biodiversity is a function of a complex system, and we do not have brains that have evolved to really consider complex systems in easy to understand ways. This is a great example of what I'm talking about here, what we see in this drawing our children's perceptions of rainforest biodiversity. Various children were asked to consider where most of the biodiversity in a rainforest was, and they drew pictures. These pictures were then analyzed and generated the pie chart that you see here. This is where the actual biodiversity is in the rainforest. You can see that children's naive perceptions of the biodiversity compared to the actual measured biodiversity are very different. Our brains are not set up in ways that naturally lead us to get a good understanding of where biodiversity is and how its functions in ecosystems, which hasn't been a problem for humans until the human population increased to the level where we could affect the planetary biosphere. And since the Industrial Revolution, the human population has developed a unique capacity to affect the biosphere, to the point that our activities on the planet are exceeding planetary boundaries in multiple domains. This graph shows you the major areas in which human activities can affect the biosphere, and you can see the different extents of those activities. In some, like freshwater use, or ozone depletion, or even 
climate change, our effect has not exceeded the planetary boundary by which those systems could recover if we stopped having the negative effects that we're currently having. In other domains, our activities have already had an irreversibly negative effect on the systems of the planet. We see this in genetic diversity. Once we drive a species to extinction, that species is not coming back. And of course, there are other domains represented here with question marks where we do not have a good handle on the effects of our activities. No other species on the planet has a graph like this. If humans have any unique capacity as a species, it's in our ability to affect the larger biosphere at the population sizes that we now exist at in the world. Let's look at a couple of different examples of how human activities are affecting the biosphere and the biodiversity of the larger ecosystems on the planet. We'll start with habitat destruction. Anytime a wild environment is converted into a man-made environment to fill human needs, we are destroying the habitats of organisms that lived in that environment before it underwent that conversion. We can see this quite clearly in how the clear cutting of Indonesian rainforest is affecting the wildlife of Indonesia. Not just insects in this case, but large charismatic species that are generally appreciated by most humans on the planet. Organisms like orangutans, tigers, and elephants. We can see what has happened to the rainforests of the large Indonesian islands of Sumatra and Borneo over the last 50 years. And in both instances, the amount of rainforest present on those islands has dramatically decreased, which has had tremendous effects on the populations of these organisms and all of the other organisms that live in that rainforest habitat. Of course, this has knock-on effects as well, in that clear-cut land is more prone to erosion and loss of soil, and the burning of rainforest in Indonesia produces large clouds of smoke that then enter into the atmosphere and affect the air quality of neighboring countries as well. Of course, it's not just the Indonesian rainforest that's undergoing these kinds of changes and habitats being destroyed. The Amazon rainforest is in a prolonged period of habitat fragmentation and destruction to provide grazing pasture for livestock. Similar patterns are seen in the African rainforests, and the ecosystems of the developed world in countries like America and Europe have already undergone the changes that come from extensive destruction and fragmentation. The net effect on all of this is the loss of habitat for species and the subsequent decline in the biodiversity of these ecosystems. Human activities are also having effects on global conditions more broadly. The pH of the oceans are decreasing as atmospheric pollution increases, which is helping to contribute to changes such as what we see with coral bleaching. The presence of human-produced toxins in ecosystems move through the food chain, increasing at higher trophic levels through the process of biological magnification. And of course, the production of greenhouse gases and their release into the atmosphere are having profound effects on our global climate. Looking at the history of global climate over the last 2,000 years, we can see that the last 100 years has demonstrated an unprecedented increase in overall global climate, which is directly correlated to the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that we are emitting into the atmosphere as a function of our activities in human society. These changes in large-scale global conditions are having profound effects now and will continue to have increasing effects into the future that will affect not only the ecosystems and other life on the planet, but us as well. It's hard to make a case that human activities are doing anything other than degrading the overall planetary system that we rely on in order to remain alive and well and at the standard of living that we've become accustomed to in this world. But lest we despair, we should also point out that humans also have a unique capacity to steward the biosphere. The other organisms that we share this planet with do not have the ability to plan into the future or to engage in large-scale public works projects in order to help preserve the biodiversity of the Earth. We do. This is the work that's accomplished through the domain of biology that we refer to as conservation biology, which uses our understandings of biology and our interactions in the larger world in order to determine the most scientifically supported and reasoned ways to help preserve the biodiversity of our planetary system. Conservation biology takes a variety of different approaches, but we'll look at some of the major ones. The first thing that we can do is actually literally work to conserve biodiversity. This can be done through things like the IUCN Red List, which uses scientific analysis of different populations of species to identify those species most at risk of extinction so that we can best target our conservation efforts towards those populations and the ecosystems in which they live. It can also take other forms like cataloging the biodiversity that's found on the planet and working to store samples of it in things like the International Seed Bank in Svalbard, Norway. 
where samples of seeds from crops around the world are kept in frozen conditions to preserve them in case our global food supply undergoes some sort of catastrophic decline as a result of either human activities on the biosphere or other changes in planetary conditions. This kind of analysis and planning are common approaches taken in conservation biology. Another field of conservation biology is restoration ecology, which looks to take steps to restore ecosystems that have been previously disrupted by human activity or other disturbances. This could include things like reintroducing apex predators back into environments from which they've been hunted by humans, such as the wolves in Yellowstone National Park, or restoring organisms like beavers to environments in which humans had hunted them to local extinction. These kinds of restoration approaches seek to return ecosystems to the more stable, more biodiverse conditions that predated the disruptions that have occurred. Generally speaking, the goal of conservation biology is to use science to inform policy. This can be seen in the previous examples, but it can also be seen in approaches like measuring the biodiversity of the different regions of the planet in order to determine those regions of maximal biodiversity where we will get the most return for our conservation conservation efforts. Science can also be used in order to model future patterns and help anticipate problems before they occur. Of course, it also involves things like simply protecting wilderness areas. National parks and other protected wilderness areas provide the rest of the biological system with human-free, or at least relatively human-free, areas in which populations of those organisms can exist without the effects that come from encroaching human society. And finally, we can appreciate nature for itself. Although we might want to forget it from time to time, humans are absolutely a part of nature, and as a result, we feel a clear connection between ourselves and the rest of the biological system. This is what E.O. Wilson has termed biophilia, our natural love for the natural world. And by cultivating this biophilia among ourselves and our fellow members of the human society, we can start to demonstrate that not only should we preserve the rest of the living world for the benefits that it provides us as humans, we should also preserve it for the sake of itself. What is our responsibility to the rest of the living system? It's not my role to answer that question for you, but it is my role to encourage you to think about that question and to come up with the answer that best resonates for you. I will note, however, that given how needy we are as a species in terms of what we require to survive and reproduce, if we continue to tax the biological system of the Earth in the way that we are currently doing, eventually the next dodo that goes extinct will be us. Thanks so much for watching our video on conservation biology. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can explain how human societies have historically affected biodiversity. Make sure you can describe the major effects that our modern human society is having on planetary conditions and provide examples of those effects. And finally, make sure that you can justify why scientifically informed conservation principles can benefit both humans and the rest of the biosphere. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment here at the end and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. But wait! Don't go yet! Congratulations! You did it! You made it through all of these videos, which is fantastic. You have an entire advanced level courses worth of biology in your brain now, which is definitely something that you didn't have when you first started watching this video series. And you did that. You are the one who watched these videos. You are the one that engaged with these videos in the way that you needed to in order to get that understanding into your brain. And I wanna say thanks for that. I hope that these videos were useful for you and I hope that on the whole, you found them to be a decent and relatively watchable experience. But I also want to encourage you not to stop now. If you have questions, you need to get answers to those questions. You can always get in touch with me by using the information down below the video, but I'm sure you can also get in touch with the other biology educators in your lives in order to continue that learning process. This course is just one step in a much larger journey towards your biological understanding. And if you're like me, that's a fascinating journey to be on and it's one that's never going to stop. So thanks again for watching all of these videos. I really do appreciate it. And I hope that you have a great day, that you've had a great experience through them. And I hope that you have a great life, both as a biologist and as an informed and scientifically literate citizen of the world. Thanks again.